Okay, so first of all, what I'd like to say is that I, I've had the good fortune to be here at all the seminars, kind of um, as, as they've developed for the last two years. So, um, and one thing that has been done with the uh, presentations so far, they've all been um, um, studies that have looked at data that was collected from individuals and which requires the um, the idea that you're going to be recruiting subjects, have those subjects come in. Many of you have been involved with this sort of process um, and it's difficult. It's difficult to recruit subjects and get subjects to keep their appointments and all that, those kinds of things and collect all the data and then analyze the data. Um, but the one thing that I've noticed, um, none of the presentations in the seminars so far have been looking at population health and wellness. And um, that's one of the reasons why I thought maybe I could present a little different perspective, um, show you some things about some data availability that you may or may not be aware of, and uh, just talk a little bit about that today, and then present some uh, data that I've been involved with uh, analyzing before, and um, just kind of go from there. So, so with that, um, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about, as I mentioned, population um, level physical activity research. So um, to begin with, um, there are a whole lot of different um, national health surveys and you may or may not, I'm, I'm sure that you're aware of some of them, I'm sure that you've heard some things about data that originated in some of them and some studies that have been done with the data that they collected, um, but many of them have um, information that pertains to physical activity. It's, it's presented somewhat different than what you would probably see in um, where you're recruiting subjects and you might have a, an N of um, you know, 25 or 50 or 75 subjects. Um, in population health management, you're looking at thousands of people rather than um, um, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 or whatever. Um, so that's, that's one difference that I can, I can uh, bring up. Um, so these, this is a list of a number of the surveys, some of which I think you've heard of before. Um, the behavior risk factor surveillance system is one survey. And I will say that this also, which is important, all of the data that's collected by these federal government surveys is considered public domain and it's all posted online and you can go and look at the data. You can search for these different surveys, find the data, look at them from different years. And as you can see, um, some of them go back as far as 1957, the National Health Interview Survey. And the, the survey that I'm gonna be talking to you mainly about today um, is one where data came from the National Health and Interview Examination Survey. They take a subset of the people that are in that particular survey and then they do another survey that's called the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey or MEPS. And it, um, each year in MEPS they get around 32,000 um, people that they interview and um, collect medical expenditure data on and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of this medical um, expenditure information is available. But also um, there is information about physical activity along the lines of all the things that we focus on like frequency, intensity, time and type of exercise. So it has, these surveys have questions that pertain to all those things. Now. Um, it's important to recognize that because these, mo most of these are surveys, although there are some direct data collection components, but most of them are surveys, which means that the people are reporting on themselves. So self-report always has um, skewing, which goes in the direction of making the person healthier or taller or way less or things like that. So when you're self-reporting how much you exercise, 
Um, it's kind of like the fishermen, you know, you get a, a larger amount of exercise than you actually think. Um, but in one of these surveys, um, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, in a couple of blocks of time from 2003 to 2006 and then again from 2011 to 2014, they not only did the surveys but they also did, um, well they, they also do a physical exam part of this where, where people go to um, these uh, locations and get a whole bunch of um, physical exam things done, but they also used accelerometers during those times, so they were able to correlate what the people said they were doing and what they were actually doing, how many steps they were taking, all those kinds of things. And as you might expect, the self-report was quite inflated over uh, the, the other stuff. Um, um, in fact, when they did the in Haines, for instance, in 2003, 2004, they looked at self-report of physical activity. About 40% of adults said they met national physical activity guidelines. Um, and this was re related to aerobic exercise. It, as, as when they used the accelerometer data on a sampling of those people, they found out that the actual percentage of people meeting national, federal guidelines and recommendations was 3.8%. About 40% said they did, so their perception of how much physical activity they're actually doing and how much they're actually doing is, uh, there's a wide gap. However, um, there, there definitely is a, a relationship between people who report that they're doing more physical activity and those who are more physically active. And um, the one most reliable thing is if you ask people, are you completely physically inactive, and they say yes, which about 25% of adults in the United States do, they say yes to that question, you can take them at their word. If they say they're not doing anything, then that's probably accurate, an accurate report of their physical activity level. But the rest of the people, there's a, a skewing in, in the direction of doing more than they actually do. So anyway, there are a number of these different surveys that are available and you can get to all of this data. Um, there are seminars that the, the, the different um, groups put on, the National Institutes of Health and some other federal government agencies put on seminars to actually show you and teach you how to work these on these things. There's a lot of online um, information available. There are um, tools that you can use that are online that you can do basic analysis of some of the data that's there. So you can get some basic stuff out of these. So, but basically the, this to give you an idea, unlike the, the most of the physical activity research that we've heard about in the seminars before where, where subjects are recruited, subjects come in, they go through a specific protocol, they might go through a training protocol, and then they come back and they're pre-tested and post-tested, all those kinds of things. Most of the federal government survey data is collected by um, questionnaire, diary, um, which are both self-report, observation and also in some cases direct measurement as I was mentioning with N. Haynes back in 2000, um, 2003 to 6 and then also from 2011 to 2014. Um, generally people are placed in different categories based on their physical activity. Active is when they're meeting um, the national recommendations, which for right now, for instance, for aerobic exercise, you'd be talking about the national recommendations are um, 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise um, during the course of a week or um, um, a total of, I'm trying to think here, uh, I'm blanking for some reason, um, um, uh, 60 minutes of vigorous exercise, which is not that much, over the course of a week, you know, um, 20 minutes three days a week, 
or some combination of moderate intensity and vigorous intensity. And so um, they look at those things and they determine whether you've met those or not. Then they also have um, strength exercise goals similarly and, and so on. Um, so they classify people into active, insufficiently active, where they're doing some physical activity, but they're not meeting physical activity guidelines and physically inactive. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk to you today about some data that I was involved with looking at in the medical expenditure panel survey. Um, and um, the overall view that I was trying to approach was the combined effects of body mass index and physical activity on healthcare expenditures in adults who are um, 45 to 64. And I'll mention why I chose that group in just a couple minutes here. So just to give you a quick thing, I think many of you um, are familiar with body mass index. I'm, most often we talk about percentage of body fat and body composition measures, but the World Health Organization, the CDC, other public health organizations talk about um, the, the body mass index categories. And again, um, they do this because it's easy. Um, you can either um, weigh a person and measure them or you can have them self-report their height and weight. And as I mentioned, they're likely to be a little taller than they normally are and a little lighter than they normally are when they self-report. Um, but anyway, they determine that and then they put people into these categories. Underweight, normal weight, overweight, and then uh, three subsections of obesity. And you can see the numbers that you, you get for these. Body mass index is defined as your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So that's how you calculate these numbers. So all of you, as you're sitting here, you can calculate your own BMI if you wanted to based on your height and weight. So that's the first thing. We need to define that. So based on that, there, there has been a fair amount of research that's been done that shows that um, healthcare expenditures, um, when they're compared with body mass index numbers, show this relationship. And this is actually um, like a, um, let's see here. Um, maybe you got the, there it goes. Um, if you start here and you go up, you can see this is the highest down here. And it goes, they call this a J shaped curve. So starts out high, goes down a little bit, and then goes steadily back up and ends up higher on the far right end. And you can see down here when you're looking at um, use of federal government data that you can get huge numbers. I mean, these are the numbers of subjects in each of those categories. You get, of course, a lot less in underweight and um, in the extreme obesity, but a lot in the normal weight. Um, you know, in this case, close to 140,000 subjects. So uh, when you get this, this number of subjects, then the, the error is very minimal. It really narrows down error. So this is from um, a, a study that was published based on data that's in these surveys. So, um, so as far as the older adults go, um, what I was looking for, I selected the medical expenditure panel survey because it gave the healthcare expenditure data, but also was looking at 45 to 64 year old people because that's the age group where you have the oldest workers. I mean, traditionally, um, a lot of people have retired in the past and it used to be that Medicare and Social Security started at age 65. Now they're gradually moving that up, so people are retiring a little bit later now. But um, this, this group is the oldest group of workers, basically. And, and even if the people are not employed, they're still included in the data set. So, um, and this, just some characteristics, it's the first age group where chronic diseased 
rather than accidents become the main driver of healthcare expenditures. They have the highest healthcare expenditures of the working age adults. They're, they have the highest BMIs of working age adults. They have the lowest physical activity levels of working age adults. And also, th this was of interest because no previous studies looked at BMI, physical activity, and healthcare expenditures um, combined, those three things, or those several things. These are characteristics of the, um, the, the group that I analyzed, and you can see that there are um, 6,600 people that fell into that age category, um, and um, the mean age ended up being 53. Um, they were slightly more females than males, about 50, almost 52 percent females, 9 um, percent Hispanic, um, white, um, and ethnicity and race are, are uh, listed separately. Um, ethnicity is, in the in U.S. Uh, survey terms, is specifically just Hispanic, um, and then race are all the other categories that you'd think about, but white race was 82.7 percent. Uh, the mean high um, health care um, expenditures was $4,656 a year, the median, and remember these are positively skewed distributions, so the, the mean is going to be higher than the median, but the median is kind of the middle number. So there's a lot of people with not that many health care expenditures and not a lot with real high health care expenditures, but the ones with real high health care expenditures might be off the chart. I mean, they have um, huge health care expenditures. Um, the median um, health care expenditure was 1658 and then um, the people that self-reported, and again this is an inflated number, I rec recognize that, self-reported that they exercise three days a week for 30 minutes a day or more, and that would be considered moderate intensity exercise is about 53 percent, which is a high number. Probably if we put the accelerometers on the people, we'd still come up with a number more like 10 percent or something like that. But we're talking about three days a week here, not necessarily reaching the, um, the um, national recommendations is what I was trying to say. Okay. So um, the physical activity for, for the uh, analysis that I did was uh, low physical activity defined as physical activity less than or equal to two days a week, which includes zero, one, and two. So the people that are completely sedentary plus people who do a little bit of exercise. And then the high physical activity were people um, three days a week and more. And this, this actually is looking at aerobic exercise, so walking, running, cycling, swimming, continuous forms of exercise. I didn't include specifically resistance training because in the, in the medical expenditure panel survey that's not covered well. So, um, so this is a, the relationship basically that came out of this data. And this is using a, a graphing method that uh, uses software called R. Um, so basically this is the relationship, if you can see this, on the far um, left there is um, healthcare expenditures in dollars and it goes all the way from zero to 15,000 and on the bottom is body mass index which goes from 20, uh, 20 body mass index up to 70 body mass index. Remember 40 is where you get into the highest obesity range so 70 is way off the chart um, and you see down in the place where most of the people are that you have pretty flat, slightly upsloping relationship here um, with healthcare expenditures. Now, if you look at this though, this is different, definitely different from the J-shaped curve that we were seeing before because this is showing that at the, the lowest BMIs, um, and remember this is qualified for the population between um, the age group of 45 and 64. So we're taking out uh, all of the older people. And, and when, when you get into people that are near death, um, they, they will have 
obviously um, some, some um, I guess, very large expenditures, but they also will have, have uh, sometimes be losing weight. And so when people sometimes, when they're very elderly, when they get into the underweight category, it's not an intentional thing. They're not dieting to get there. They're just having health issues that are causing that and that that causes and pushes up in a general population the overall number of people um, in that underweight category and it looks like their health is really bad because they're unhealthy and they're losing weight because they're unhealthy but in this group you kind of take a lot of those out so the relationship is more of a um, curvilinear thing and as you get into the obesity ranges you, you start to see it go up at a steeper slope so, so that's the thing with that. Okay, so this one I think is hopefully a little bit more interesting to you. Um, in this one, we're looking at healthcare expenditures, and this is from the data that, that I looked at in the medical expenditure panel survey, where we look at the different BMI classifications and we compare um, low physical activity two or less days per week versus high physical activity and you see that the healthcare expenditures in every category all the way through the whole range of BMI um, is lower in the physically active people. So your natural inclination is to say, oh great, that means physical activity is reducing the healthcare expenditures in, in, in all the categories and that, that looks like a great trend. Um, in just a couple of minutes I'll burst your bubble somewhat on that unfortunately, um, but I, that's, how, that's how I would interpret this particular slide. Um, so uh, let's take a look here. So um, in the analysis that I was doing some of these things seem pretty simplistic but you know I was trying to look at specific things and I had three hypotheses and one research question. The first hypothesis was the relationship between total um, health care expenditures and BMI will be a J-shaped curve in the civilian non-institutionalized U.S. populations between ages of 45 and 64. And as you saw in that last graph or on the graph, the two graphs ago, uh, I can back up here, the relationship is not uh, a J-shaped one because down here at the very end, down here, we don't have the elevated healthcare expenditures with the lower um, numbers. Um, it, it would be important to also say that you have less people that fall into the low um, weight categories. Underweight in a population that's not near the end of life is um, less common and so um, that's, that's important to point out. Um, and the finding here was the relationship between the healthcare expenditures and BMI in this population is curv curvilinear positive and increasingly upsloping in the upper obesity range. So just as we just looked at on, on that one. So the J-shaped curve which has been um, um, asserted a lot was not not the finding of this particular uh, analysis. So uh, the second hypothesis is the lowest total healthcare expenditures independent of physical activity level will occur in the normal weight range between 18.5 and 25.0 uh, or less than 25.0. And the finding is the lowest overall total healthcare expenditures occurred in this um, particular group in the underweight category. So as it went all the way down, so being underweight was not a, a detriment in this sort of situation. There are similar uh, data that's in um, uh, a study that's called a, a population study called the Framingham study that's been done in Framingham, Massachusetts. And what they found was that down in the, um, as, as they got Healthcare expenditures in the lower weight ranges um, were higher, but when they controlled for smoking, they took smoking out then um, because smokers tend to generally be lighter, that negated that. And, it, and it, still, the, the lighter people um, had lower healthcare expenditures. So, 
Um, so that's, that's the situation with that. Third hypothesis is that higher levels of regular physical, um, regular physical activity participation are associated with lower total health care expenditures at any given level of BMI. And the finding here was the high physical activity group had lower total health care expenditures in every BMI category than the low physical activity um, group, which we saw in that previous graph again. So that's, that's that. Now, um, this is where we get into the conflicting thing with, uh, I told you I was going to burst your bubble, maybe, if um, everybody gets excited about, oh, wow, look, exercise is lowering health care costs and everything like that. Um, so, um, basically, the research question that I was trying to answer was, which variables in the 2004 Medical Expenditure Panel Survey were most strongly associated with variability in total annual health care expenditures, and what was their relationship uh, to the association between physical activity and annual health care expenditures in the BMI categories? And this is where um, the analysis got to be a little more uh, um, complicated, but also was very enlightening. Um, so let me uh, tell you about that. So the analysis involved logistic regression, which um, um, is, uh, I, I guess, a process that I, I learned through, the, through this study in particular. Um, but in this case, what we did was we took 28 variables that were included in the MEPS data set and looked at the potential effects that each of those variables would have on the variance in healthcare expenditures. So, um, in other words, how, how much influence does each of these things um, have? And this included physical activity was one of the 28 variables, and we used variables that were one had to be present in the survey. You know, you can't use data that you don't have. And secondly, um, that it was, they were uh, variables that the literature suggested would have an effect on healthcare expenditures. The findings are that 14 of the vari variables were found to be statistically significant in their influence on variance of healthcare expenditures, but physical activity was not one of them. It wasn't one of the 14 that was considered to be the most influential, which is uh, befuddling. Like for somebody like me, I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, that can't be right. But uh, you got you to gotta look at the analysis and it, it is right. So physical activity was not one of the 14 variables exerting significant um, um, influence on healthcare expenditures. And also we know that because of the regression model, there were some variables that were unobserved that we didn't have in the model because they weren't available in the survey that do exert an influence because there were some leftover variants that we couldn't explain with the, the uh, findings that we had. So, um, so this is, this is kind of where we have to go with this. So high physical activity was generally associated with lower health care expenditures, but physical activity was not the reason for the observed differences. Rather, covariance within the individuals in the high physical activity group explained um, the variance. So it was other factors other than the physical activity that um, may go in concert with the things that physically active people um, do that, that have the effects. So in other words, the, the uh, statistically significant covariance, you can look at these, are Hispanic ethnicity, poverty category, days missed from work due to illness, out-of-pocket medical expenditures, self-writing of health, having a usual um, health care provider, health insurance type, diagnosis of high blood pressure, arthritis, coronary, a diagnosis of high blood pressure, or arthritis, coronary artery disease, and or asthma, um, whether they have a white or blue collar uh, job, or are unemployed, age and race. So these 14 things show that basically Healthcare expenditures are a fairly complicated, multifactorial um, 
consumer behavior that is affected by a number of things and it, and it appears when you first look at the graphs that physical activity is one of the things that exerts an influence on it. But in fact, physical activity in the model was not one of the ones that, that um, came up as having, exerting an influence. So, um, um, taking that a step further, um, I thought, well, so if physical activity really doesn't have a direct effect on, um, on healthcare expenditures, then we need to look at what factors predict that people are going to be physically active. All of us know, everybody in this room knows that physical activity produces, um, regular physical activity produces improvements in health and people who are more physically active um, generally have less of, of a lot of illnesses, um, they have better quality of life, there's a lot of things that we can document. Um, but, so, we need to be thinking about what kinds of things predict that a person's going to be physically active. So in this case, we took the regression model and made the dependent variable high physical activity participation and then the regression model had a bunch of variables that, are, that could be related to that and went through that process and narrowed it down to the ones that were significant. And um, when we did that process, eight independent variables were found to be significantly related to high physical activity participation. These include gender, level of education completed, um, subjective rating of health, diagnosis of hypertension or arthritis, depression, and any activity limitation, and BMI category. So all of those things have um, some predictive value or stronger predictive value in whether or not a person is going to be um, exercising or not. You can see I'm not, I'm not saying what side of any of those are. I mean generally people with higher levels of education are more often um, more physically active and along with being more physically active generally they have better health status. But, but these are the things that help predict that. Maybe these are things we should be you know, thinking about, and I think we are thinking about them, but um, we, we've got to be really careful in coming to conclusions that something is cause-effect. Um, we can see associations that are, that are there and certainly um, Physical activity is associated with lower health care expenditures, but not because of the physical activity, but rather because of um, some of the covariates that people who are physically active also possess, if that makes sense. So that's sort of a, hopefully that um, is, is making some sense. So this, in conclusion, I want to just say that um, as far as archival data goes, there's a, there's a lot of data available and it's available to you right now. I mean, you can pick up your laptop, open it up, go to National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and the data will be right there on your screen. And you can then, you know, whatever types of analyses that you'd like to do, um, you can do those. I mean, it may take some, a learning curve of, going through and, and figuring out what you can do with that, but the data is there, it's already collected. And the other good news is the Institutional Review Board just um, basically says, oh, this data is already collected, there's no risk. As long as it was, the data was collected in an ethical way. Now, um, that, that means that with these federal government um, surveys, they, they've been done ethically, they've been done randomly, they've been, they meet all the criteria and the IRB is great with that. If you took um, some data to them and say, well I want to analyze this data for a project, it's from this prison and it's where they uh, made the prisoners do such and such and, and um, that kind of data is not uh, ethically collected so the IRB is not going to sign off on that. But on the, the government surveys, um, it's smooth sailing through IRB. You know, it's usually one 
one meeting and you're done, and you got the stamp of approval, uh, as long as you're using recognized uh, data. So that's, that's one good thing. Um, so one of the drawbacks, though, is analyses with this kind of data can only use the things that they've already collected. So yes, the data is already collected, but they may not have collected all of the data that you would like to see. I mean, there might be things that you'd say, man, it would have been great if they would have done this with these people, but they didn't. And so if you don't have the data, you obviously can't use that. So that's something to think about. And then the final thing is just sort of the warning about um, that we need to not jump to conclusions. Like when we, when we see um, a graph like, well, um, I, guess, I guess the one I'm looking for is this one. We can't jump to the conclusion that it's physical activity that's causing this, causing these differences. And you, you might say, well, why not? Well, um, because we, we need to look at the, you know, the influences. And, and when we did the analysis, the physical activity was not, was not even in the top 14. It wasn't statistically significant in its impact on healthcare expenditures. Now, I, I recognize healthcare expenditures, thinking about healthcare expenditures might be outside the things that you guys think about on a day to day basis, um, but um, I, I had an interest in it because. Um, I worked in healthcare for 16 years, so I was I was working in hospital settings, and um, it, even in one hospital, and I, some of you have heard this before in classes, but in one hospital, one day, the, this was back in the 1990s, the human resources director of the hospital I was working with, uh, working in, came into my office, and he had a I'm not kidding, he had a box of paper that was probably um, you know, I don't know, 10 reams, 500 sheets each. And, and he brought the box in, he sits it on my desk and he says, can you do anything with this? And I said, I don't know, what is it? And he said, well, these are our last three years healthcare claims. We need to do something to reduce our healthcare expenditures among our employees in the hospital. And so, what we ended up, what ended up happening was we did develop a employee wellness program to try to address some of those issues. Um, and that, that's a whole different, whole different story, but I'm just saying um, doing the analysis, that's kind of like the same thing. Uh, I don't know that, um, um, you know, I don't know how IRB would look at that, a box full of healthcare claims. They probably wouldn't like the, uh, the fact that probably not everything is confidential. You know, there's, there's personal identifiers on some of the things. You'd have to remove all the personal identifiers. But in these government surveys, all the personal identifiers are already removed. So you, don't, you can't link, I mean, I suppose by random chance you could link somebody, but you really can't link anybody that's in these surveys unless you know them or something. And even then, it's, it's uh, data that's, you know, huge numbers, thousands of people rather than uh, 20 people or something like that.